All right, so today's topic is blockchain and cryptocurrency technologies. Actually, today we are trying to, you know, learn the terminology and have an overview. So this is why I'm going to use uh, docu the document NIST Interna internal report, sorry, 8202, blockchain technology overview. This is a very nice document. And uh, if you're really interested, I rec recommend you to read it because this technology, you know, emerged in a very fast way. And everybody start talking about it. Everybody start talking about cryptocurrencies and blockchains. And it turned out that people are saying very wrong things about this. So actually NIST here in this document tried to summarize the main topics and provide the definition so that we will be on the same page. Okay. So let's start with basic uh, ideas and definitions. Blockchains are temper evident and temper resistant digital ledgers implemented in a distributed fashion and usually without the central authority. So as you can see here, generally the main idea is with having no central authority. Okay. Of course you can have something like a central authority and sometimes you can argue if there is a central authority or not. For instance, in Ethereum, there is Ethereum Foundation. We don't have to listen to them. But generally, everybody listens to them and there's an update. So it looks like there's a central authority at the end of the day. They enable a community of users to record transactions in a shared ledger. And this is actually the main idea. So if you, when people you want to say that they want to use a blockchain, they need to understand that this is a, actually a data storage and you record some transactions there. And what you record actually is your choice, okay? In cryptocurrencies, we actually record transactions, so they determine how much amount of digital currency somebody has. Okay, but you can create any kinds of blockchains as you want. No transaction can be changed once published. This is also important, and sometimes when I talk about it, people think that this is some unnecessary detail, but this is actually what it changes a blockchain from a regular database. Okay. Because in your, for instance, bank account, when, it, uh, when you receive some amount of money, it is updated in the database in the bank. Okay, here we don't update anything. So in the blockchain, at some block, you receive, for instance, two bitcoins, and days later, you receive three bitcoins, and that's it. Nobody says that it, it, they are combined. Okay, your wallet software actually scans all of the blockchain and then says that you have five bitcoins. Okay, that is very, very important. So once you write something, it stays there. In 2008, the blockchain idea was combined with several other technologies to create modern cryptocurrencies. And of course, the first such blockchain based cryptocurrency was Bitcoin. So for this reason, next week, we will start talking about cryptocurrencies starting with Bitcoin. Within the Bitcoin blockchain, information representing electronic cash is attached to a digital address. Bitcoin users can digitally sign and transfer rights to that information to another user, and the Bitcoin blockchain records this transfer publicly, allowing all participants of the network to independently verify the validity of the transactions. Here you can see that why we cover digital signature, because this is what we are doing actually. So, when you create a transaction, actually you are saying that I had these bitcoins, now they belong to this address, and that's it. And most of the time, nobody knows who that address belongs to. Okay. Actually, they don't even know the public key of that address because you are actually create when you create a, a Bitcoin address, you actually create a public key, but then take the hash of it and provide the hash. So when anybody looks at the hash, they don't know the original public key. So you provide the public key when you actually want to transfer it again. So the only the owner of the that uh, address can claim the account, uh, claim the Bitcoins, okay? So this will be more clear when we see Bitcoins. But this is important, what you're right, what you're actually writing to the blockchain is you are transferring the rights of some digital currency to somebody else, that's it, okay? And of course, this is done in, you know, in a programming language. So actually when you make a transaction, what you do is actually uh, write uh, some 
uh, code and all of the nodes run that code. But of course, since we are using a software, the code is created for us. We simply say that uh, I'm transferring this amount of money to this person and that's it. The Bitcoin blockchain is stored, maintained and collaboratively managed by a distributed group of participants. So this is valid for, of course, every cryptocurrency. So this is what we uh, say a network. So people uh, create a network like a BitTorrent. And, you know, they try to synchronize the ledger they have. Okay. But of course, uh, this is also a strange since, you know, Bitcoin is very famous for the last 10 years. And, you know, uh, people are, you know, the price is really increased at some point, like to $65,000. And currently it is more than $30,000. And in such a system, people think that uh, maybe there are hundreds, there's of thousands of computers, you know, keeping this distributed ledger, but actually only there are a few thousand nodes scattered around the world. But if you want to be a node, you can simply download Bitcoin Core, install it on your laptop. If you have a hard drive, you know, that is around 500 gigabytes, you can simply store the whole Bitcoin blockchain since the starting day, okay? But of course, the software allows you to, you know, modify so you can actually store only the two gigabytes of it, and which is the last part, and so. On. This, along with certain cryptographic mechanisms, makes the blockchain resilient to attempts to alter the ledger later. So this is, as you can see, where the hash functions comes into play. This is why we learned, you know, hash functions and digital signatures. Blockchain is hype, but the technology is not well understood. And this is really sad. You know, it is now, you know, since 2008, it is like 15 years now, and still people don't know how this technology works and what it is. Okay. I still haven't seen anybody in Turkey who exactly understood Bitcoin. I'm sorry for that, but this is the truth. All of the things I mentioned here, most probably nobody knows in Turkey. And this is a sad thing. Okay. In all of the workshops and so on, they say that, you know, it is encrypted. The crypto encrypts it, everything is so. So there are many misunderstandings. There is no encryption at all and so on. Okay, it is not magical. It will not solve all your problems. This is also important because when something becomes becomes a hype, people, you know, try to use it everywhere. Okay. I received, you know, hundreds of requests to, from companies to use blockchain technology in their companies. And then when I ask what they're going to, right to this blockchain, they say that they don't know what the blockchain is. It is hype and they just want to be a company that uses it so that they can, you know, show it off. So that is the idea actually. And, uh, you know, there are many papers saying that we can use blockchain here and there and there. So if you look at the literature, it looks like blockchain solves all of your problems. But unfortunately, almost all of the academic papers, theses, projects are redundant or wrong. That is a sad thing to say. But if you, or for instance, if you say that I wrote a master thesis in this area, most probably it is wrong. I'm sorry. This is the truth. There's a tendency to want to apply it to every sector in every way imaginable. So everything is done. But again, the thing is that they're not, uh, most of the time, you know, they are either inefficient or redundant or wrong. The use of blockchain technology is not a silver bullet. And there are issues that must be considered, such as how to deal with malicious users, how controls are applied, and the limitations of the implementations. Instead of how can we make our problem fit into the blockchain technology paradigm, the mindset should be how could blockchain technology potentially benefit us? Okay, this is the trick here because people try to, you know, look at the problem in the as the first question. So they try to, you know, apply blockchain technology to every imaginable way. But again, you know, uh, when you start talking about these abstract ideas, you realize that, for instance, the blockchain they try to create uh, becomes hundreds of terabytes in just a few days. So you have to uh, think about scalability and so on, and so on, security and so on. Organizations should treat blockchain technology like they would any other technological solution at their disposal and use it in appropriate situations. Organizations must understand that while changes to actual blockchain data may be difficult, applications using the blockchain as a data layer work 
uh, data layer work around this by treating later blocks and transactions as updates or modifications to earlier blocks and transactions. Yes, we write something to the blockchain. We don't update it, but the next thing that we write might affect the previous one. So for instance, when you receive a Bitcoin in a block, this is the data, you have three Bitcoins. In later blocks, you transfer the rights to somebody else, so you no longer have three Bitcoins. So this is what it's trying to be meant here. So you update it, uh, update it in a different way, not rewriting the data, but writing the modification to the blockchain. Another critical aspect of blockchain technology is how the participants agree that the transaction is valid. This is called reaching consensus, and there are many models for doing so, each with positives and negatives for particular business cases, and we will see a brief description of all of them in the following slides. Blockchain implementations are often designed with a specific purpose or function. Example functions include cryptocurrencies, smart contracts, which are software deployed on the blockchain and executed by computers running that blockchain, and distributed ledger systems between businesses and so on. There are two general high-level categories, permissionless and permissions. In a permissionless blockchain network, anyone can read and write to the blockchain without authorization, and this is how cryptocurrencies, you know, Bitcoin and Ethereum works, because you can, everybody can be a miner, and you know, write uh, things to the blockchain without any authorization. So anybody can just join and leave whenever they want and so on. Permission blockchain networks limit participation to specific people or organizations and allow finer grain controls. Okay. Here you have something different because only some authorized people can write to the blockchain, but most of the time everybody can read it. So this is also important because people only think that there is only permissionless blockchains. As for instance, when Bitcoin became popular like eight or nine years ago, people came to me and tried to say that they want to create a Turkish cryptocurrency as a, but a governmental uh, cryptocurrency. And they thought that they had to have miners and everybody can mine this cryptocurrency. But I said that, you know, you have the authority to, you know, create the cryptocurrency yourself. You don't need miners. You could be the only person who can introduce new money whenever you want. And this was something they couldn't understand for a long time. They couldn't, uh, they, everybody thought that everything should be identical to Bitcoin. Okay, when they say blockchain, they understand Bitcoin. So this is why they cannot think of, permission blockchains, but there are permission blockchains. That is the catch here. Blockchains are a distributed ledger comprised of blocks. Each block is comprised of a block header contain, containing metadata about the block and block data containing a set of transactions and related data, okay? So we actually divide it as the you know, block header and block data. Every block header, except for the first block of the blockchain, which is generally referred as the genesis block, contains a cryptographic link to the previous blocks header. So actually here we are kind of uh, create this link by hash functions, right? We actually miners in the case of Bitcoin, obtain a, a hash value, which is related to that block's data. So in the next block, you write the answer to this mining problem. So this is what links the uh, blocks in the Bitcoin. But of course, you don't have to have a miner in every blockchain. Each transaction involves one or more blockchain network users and a recording of what happened, and it is digitally signed by the user who submitted the transaction. Okay. Blockchains are distributed digital ledgers of cryptographically signed transactions that are grouped into blocks. Each block is cryptographically linked to the previous one, making it tamper evident. As you can see, we don't use the word tamper proof because you can go and change it. But when somebody changes, we understand that they change it. This is why we call it tamper evidence. So saying that nothing can be changed is not the uh, correct definition because if we want to change it, we can change it. Think about Ethereum. Uh, actually, I will explain when we talk about Ethereum, but at some point there was a dispute and the Ethereum Foundation wanted to change some block. So they change it and some people who didn't want to have 
that change actually created a fork. For this reason, we have Ethereum and Ethereum Classic as two different blockchains, okay? But the thing is that we changed it. So it is not tamper-proof, it is tamper because if most of us wants to change it, we can change it. That is the idea. So each block is cryptographically linked to the previous one after validation and undergoing a consensus decision. As new blocks are added, older blocks become more difficult to modify, creating tamper resistance. Because if you want to, for instance, in Bitcoin, if you want to modify a block that is you know, 1,000 before the current block, then you have to create the following 1,000 blocks, which will take a lot more time to you know, reach the current part which will we talk about this when we talk about Bitcoin. But, you know, older blocks become more uh, secure in this way. This is why in current cryptocurrencies, when we make a transaction and it is written on the blockchain, we actually wait some time to more blocks to be added on top of it so that we can be sure that, okay, that transaction really occurred and it will not be changed in the future. So in Bitcoin, this is six blocks. So you wait like an hour to be sure that your transaction really occurred but if you transfer a huge amount of money but bitcoin uh, developers suggest you to wait 24 hours to be sure that it is really you know it will not be modified in the future new blocks are replicated across copies of the ledger within the network and any conflicts are resolved automatically using established rules thank you by this actually this means that uh, two different blocks, uh, for instance, we are currently at the 100th block and assume that two different miners created the 101st block, but they are different, okay? This is called a conflict. And uh, here we say that there are established rules to overcome this conflict. Uh, so at this conflict, in my example, we actually created a parallel universe. So we want to wait which of these two blockchains will become longer. So the, the one that becomes longer first, everybody moves to that one. So th this is one of the established rules in Bitcoin, but actually in almost every cryptocurrency. In Bitcoin, the blockchain enabled users to be pseudonymous. This is important because most of the time we know the addresses, but we don't know who those addresses belong to, right? This is why we call pseudonymous. This meant, this means that Users are anonymous, but their account identifiers are not. Additionally, all transactions are publicly visible. This is also shocking to many people because they think that, you know, since this is cryptocurrency, there should be encryption involved. So everything are encrypted. And so we cannot see the transactions at all. But on the contrary, we can see every transaction since the beginning. Okay. So nothing is encrypted in Bitcoin or similar cryptocurrencies. So everything is public. We know that which account has what amount of Bitcoin or Ethereum and so on. But most of the time, we don't know who those address belongs to. But of course, there are ways to uh, link it to uh, real people. For instance, if you want to you know, uh, gather some money and if you put your Bitcoin or Ethereum address and you know, tweet it, then we know that who you are, right? This has effectively enabled Bitcoin to offer pseudo-anonymity because accounts can be created without any identification or authorization process. Such processes are typically required by know your customer laws. Okay, this is why whenever you create an account at a crypto exchange uh, place, they would ask you to, you know, uh, have a photo of you with your ID next to your face and so on, so that they, they will know their customers, okay? But if you don't involve in a crypto exchange uh, place, but want to exchange Bitcoin with each other, you don't have to do that, right? Everybody can be pseudonymous there. Since Bitcoin was pseudonymous, it was essential to have mechanisms to create trust in an environment where users could not be easily identified. Without trusted intermediaries, the needed trust within a blockchain network is enabled by four key characteristics. One is the ledger. The technology uses an append on the ledger to provide full transactional history. Unlike traditional databases, transactions and values in a blockchain are not overridden. So this is one of the ways you create trust because everybody sees everything, so it's transparent. 
Secure blockchains are cryptographically secure, ensuring that the data has not been tampered with and that the data is attestable. So this is why, again, we have covered some cryptographic topics like hash functions and digital signatures. We provide temper evidence uh, evidence by you know hash functions, and you know we know that only authorized person can make these transfers by using digital signatures. So this is where the cryptography comes into play. Shared, the, the, the ledger is shared amongst multiple participants. This provides transparency. Again, as I said, you can install it on your laptop and store every transaction. I think it is 440 gigabytes for Bitcoin. Similarly, it is around that in Ethereum, but Ethereum increasing uh, faster than Bitcoin. So in the future, they will have to create a new update where they will, you know, remove most of the unused smart contracts and store it in an, another hard drive, but keep the uh, most used uh, smart uh, contracts on an SSD. So servers will most probably have an SSD and uh, traditional hard drive to store all of this data because at some point it will exceed one terabyte. Distributed. The blockchain can be distributed. This allows for scaling the number of nodes of a blockchain network to make it more resilient to attacks by bad actors. Okay. Blockchain networks can be categorized based on their permission model, which determines who can maintain them. For example, publish blocks. If anyone can publish a new block, we say that it is permissionless. If only particular users can publish blocks, it is permissioned. So in the permissionless case, these networks are open to all to participate, like cryptocurrencies, you can be part of it. To prevent malicious users, a consensus system requires users to expand or maintain resources when attempting to publish blocks and rewards them. So here, what we call the proof of work or proof of stakes come into play. In the permission case, permission blockchain networks are ones where users publishing blocks must be authorized by some authority. Since unauthorized users are maintaining the blockchain, it is possible to restrict read access and to restrict who can issue transactions. 